Greetings. Welcome to Electronics 2. This is lecture number 24. Uh, and I am Bezad Rozavi. Today we will uh, talk about the frequency response of uh, emitter followers and source followers and also about their input and output impedances. Uh, we haven't looked at the impedances in the previous frequency response studies uh, because they are relatively straightforward but in this case uh, some interesting things happen that are worth uh, looking at carefully. All right, before we go there though, let's uh, uh, look at what we covered in the previous lecture. Uh, we talked about the frequency response of the common base and common gate stages. And we saw that uh, the two have the same topology. Uh, we saw that there is no Miller effect because we don't have any capacitances from the input to the output. You know, all of the capacitances are grounded on one side, so we were able to find the poles by inspection. And we saw that we have one pole at the input, uh, so we have a capacitance of C1, whatever it is, C pi or CGS, etc. And then uh, the resistance at this node consists of RS looking to the left and 1 over GM looking to the right. So those go in parallel and get multiplied by the capacitance. And then for the output node, uh, we decided that the resistance is RC, the capacitance is the total capacitance that we have, so C2 could include C mu, uh, the collector substrate capacitance for the case of bipolar, and so on for the case of MOSFET, so that would be 1 over RC C2 for the output pole. All right, so now today uh, we can go and look at emitter followers and source followers and see how they behave. So we look at the frequency response of followers. But I would like to make sure that you remember uh, what role followers play in electronics. Uh, from electronics one, you should remember why we looked at them and why we need them. Followers act as buffers, as voltage buffers. And voltage buffers are useful anytime we have some sort of circuit, like an amplifier, and we need to drive another impedance that's pretty low, and we can't just directly connect this amplifier to this load. Okay, so here's an example. We have built a common emitter stage, and it has some gain. So the gain would be minus GM times RC, right? So let's say the gain is 10. Okay. And let's say RC is 1 kilo. But then I need to drive, for example, an 8 ohm speaker, right? So here's a speaker that has an impedance of 8 ohms. So if I just connect this directly to here, even if I don't worry about the bias conditions and so on, uh, the gain will drop considerably, right? Because minus GM times 1 kilo ohm is 10. Now, if 8 ohms goes and connects here, it will go in parallel with 1 kilo ohm. So the resistance at this point will be approximately 8 ohms. So the gain from here to here would be definitely less than 1. So to avoid that problem, we place a buffer between this stage and that stage. The purpose of this buffer is to make sure that this 8 ohms does not directly load this amplifier. Okay, so in other words, if I look this way, I, will sh I should see much, something much higher than 8 ohms. And we saw that followers can do that. Alternatively, I can say, if I look this way, I should see a much lower impedance than 1 kilo. So that's the role of a buffer. And this buffer can be realized as an emitter follower, like so, the signal goes to the base and comes out of the emitter. This is VCC. Or as a source follower. So similarly, we have something like this. And we go into the gate, we come out of the source. Okay, so these can serve as this buffer. What you might remember from electronics one was also that the voltage gain from here to here, or from here to here, is less than 1, right? It's maybe 0.9, maybe 0.8, depending on the various imperfections that we consider, 
uh, but it's less than one. So even though the voltage gain is less than one, it is still a useful circuit because it serves as a good buffer, right? It isolates this impedance from this very low impedance, this heavy load. All right, so today we want to analyze the circuits and see their frequency response. Okay, so as our first step, we go and draw the circuits. We did, uh, now we need to drop in the capacitances. Uh, but uh, let me consider a more general case where we have a resistance here. We call this RB and a resistance here. We call this RG. Again, in this case, these resistances are not added deliberately to the circuit. Rather, they represent the output resistance of the preceding circuit. So, in fact, if this guy is placed right here, then the resistance that drives it is this one kilo ohm. So this would actually be this one kilo ohm resistance. Okay, so whatever we add here is just to make sure that this models the preceding stage. So if this preceding stage, change the color of my pen. So if this preceding stage is like this, right? So that RB is just modeling the preceding stage. Okay, now we go ahead and add our capacitances, right? So let's do that. Uh, I will go back to, maybe go to this color. All right, I have a C pi from here to here. And then I have C mu from here to here. And then I have a collector substrate capacitance to ground. So that's to ground C, C, S. How about the uh, emitter source followers? All right, so we have CGS right here, CGD right here, and then two caps from the drain and the source to AC ground. So here's a CDB and here's CSB. Okay. All right. In the third step, what we do is we try to see if a, any of the capacitances can be removed, can be eliminated or merged. And in the case of the emitter follower, we see that CCS goes from AC ground to ground. So that's out of the picture. So let's uh, draw a cross across that. That's gone. And how about the source follower? We have a cap from here to AC ground. We have a cap from here to here. We have a cap from here to AC ground. And then CDB goes from AC ground to AC ground. So that's also out of the picture. Okay. All right. So in the case of the emitter follower, it seems that you have only two caps. In the case of the source follower, we have three caps. So this is a little more complicated, a little more general than this one. Uh, but in actual practice, uh, this circuit also has to drive some sort of capacitance here, right? Whatever it drives next, even if you have a wire like this, that wire has capacitance. So, yes, there is always some capacitance here and here, so we just call it whatever we want. So the two topologies still look similar, because in reality, this node also has to drive some capacitance. So just look at, we just look at one of these and try to analyze it, uh, try to find the transfer function from this input to this output and see what we get. Okay, so, um, so let's find the transfer function, which means I have to uh, draw this small signal model and do calculations. Uh, so let's do that. We can do it for this guy or this guy. It doesn't make much difference. Uh, let's go ahead and write it for the source follower. So here's the situation. We have a resistance which we call RG coming from the input source. So here's the input voltage source. And then we have CGS. So here's uh, CGS. Uh, the gate and the source have a voltage, a small signal voltage called V1 in our model. 
And then we have a dependent current source, GMV1, which goes to AC ground. This goes to AC ground. And then we have uh, another cap, CGD goes from the gate to AC ground. So that would be like this, CGD goes to AC ground. Uh, then we have a cap from the output node to AC ground. So here's a capacitance from the output node to ground, CSB. The output voltage taken from the source. So here's the output voltage. And this current source is assumed to be ideal, so it just becomes an open circuit. It's gone. Okay. Uh, we have three cap capacitances that are important, right? These three. And our objective is to find V out over V in. All right? Okay, so as usual, you have to write some KCLs or KVLs or something and solve the circuit, right? Okay, well, let's try to do that. Um, uh, <clears throat> well, uh, we start, uh, we write two KCLs, one KCL at this node, you know, call it the input node, the gate node, and one at the output node. And then those two KCLs should uh, give us two equations and two unknowns. The two unknowns are V1 and V out. So we eliminate V1, and what's left is V out. We find V out over V in. All right, so KCL at gate, right, at this gate here. Okay, so how much is this current? The current through RG is given by the voltage on the left minus the voltage on the right divided by RG. Okay, so I'm going to write RG. The voltage on the left is VE. How much is the voltage on the right terminal of RG with respect to ground? Okay, well, I have V1 and then V out, right? So V out plus V1 is the voltage from here to ground. So this V in should read minus V1 plus V out. So take a moment to make sure you understand this, right? So we're finding the current through RG, which is equal to the voltage on the left minus the voltage on the right divided by RG. And the voltage on the right is uh, we are essentially we're writing a KVL in our mind, right? The voltage on this side is this plus this, so that's that. So this is the current through RG. Okay, what else is connected to this node, to the gate node? We have this capacitance, which carries a current. So uh, this current is coming in. It has to be equal to the sum of the currents going out. This current goes out, and this current goes out, right? How much is the current through CGD? Okay, so let's... Uh, use a different color. This current here is equal to the voltage on CGD divided by the impedance of CGD. How much is the voltage from here to here? From here to here. From here to here. Right? It's the same thing. So it's V1 plus V out, as we found before. So the voltage across CGD is this plus this, so it's V1 plus V out. So I have to write V1 plus V out. That is the voltage across the capacitor. Divided by the impedance of the capacitor. How do you write the impedance of a capacitor? It's 1 over CGDS, right? This divided by this becomes CGDS. Multiply it. So that's the current through CGD. All right, and then we have this current. How much is this current? This current is this voltage divided by this impedance. This voltage is V1. So V1 CGS S. Right? Because the impedance of CGS is 1 over CGS S. Okay, so we wrote the K KVL, KCL at this gate, right? This current is equal to this plus this, so that's 1. Now let's write a, let's write a KCL at the output node. So KCL at the output, right here. 
Okay, well, we have two currents coming in and one current going out. The current coming in from this branch is V1 over uh, this impedance, right? So that's V1 CGSS, this one. Then we have that current, which is GMV1. And these two are equal to the current that flows this way, right? How much is the current through CSB? V out divided by this impedance. So V out times CSBS. So that's the second KCL. All right, very good. So we have two KCLs and two unknowns. You see V1 and V out, right? V1 and V out, V1 and V out. So we need to eliminate V1 and find V out over V in. And as you might expect, it becomes a very large fraction. So let me write that out and see what we get. So V out over V in of S, so this is H of S, right? Is equal to, is a very long fraction. So again, we have three capacitors. We're gonna get the cross products of all these capacitors. So CGD, CGS, CGD, CGS, plus CGD, CSB, plus CGS, CSB, CGS, CSB. This has to multiply by two resistances. Uh, one is RG and the other is 1 over GM, and that's times S squared. Okay, so that's the S squared term in the denominator. All right, now we have an S term, right? This has to multiply, uh, this has to be added something with an S term. Now that's actually a long equation that I can never memorize. So for that one we have RS C mu plus C pi, uh, sorry, C G S over G M plus one plus R S. Uh, actually, sorry, no, don't have that here. <coughs> Okay, so we end up with uh, plus CGS over GM plus uh, CSB over GM. So that's the coefficient of S. And then finally, we have one. This whole thing is in the denominator of this fraction. All right. Okay, so um, this is the transfer function of the source follower. For the emitter follower, it's a little more complicated because there we also have r pi, right? So here we don't have r pi, r pi is infinity. Uh, but anyway, it gives you an idea. Okay, well, so the problem is that uh, we can't really use the dominant pole approximation for followers. In other words, the two poles that we have in this denominator are not really that far from each other. So in the general case, we can't do that. So we just have to plug in the numbers and find the poles, right? If we have all of these values, we can find the poles directly from this quadratic, all right? So that's the uh, sort of disappointing result that comes out of this. Now, you might ask why we didn't try to, use, to find po the poles by inspection. So to do that, I would have to apply uh, Miller's theorem to this capacitor, break it down into one grounded capacitor at the input, one grounded capacitor at the output, and then find the poles. And we can do that. Again, that's not very accurate uh, in the case of followers. And again, we don't do that. Uh, but if you, if you want, you can definitely do that too. Okay? So the point is that for followers, typically, we don't have much flexibility in the analysis and after deriving this equation we often have to go to numerical values and see what we get uh, but uh, this is the equation that we have okay 
All right, so this is the uh, input output transfer function of the follower. Uh, now we're going to go look at the input and output impedances of followers and see what we get. They have some interesting features, properties that are worth looking at. All right, so let me go to the next page and uh, look at the input capacitance of followers. So we are looking only at the input capacitance. We could look at the entire impedance, but uh, this is really the only interesting part uh, that gives us some additional understanding of uh, these followers. So let me just go over that and show you what happens. All right, so I would like to just draw a contrast between two situations. Uh, so let me do this. So first, remember the common source stage, right? We had this, and we said there was a CGS here for the transistor, and then this CGD experienced Miller multiplication, CGS. And that's how we found the input capacitance. We say it was CGS plus CGD times 1 plus GMRD, right? So here we wrote CN is equal to CGS plus 1 plus GMRD times CGD. That's what we found before. We never really called it the input capacitance, but we did have this equation when we were trying to find the input pole of the circuit, right? Okay, so now let's go to a follower, for example, a source follower, and ask ourselves if I have a situation like this, and I have the CGS, right? CGS. And then I have the CGD, which goes from here to AC ground, so I'll just draw it like this. CGD. Okay, now if you want to be complete, we can also include uh, CSB, as we saw before. And I would like to see what the input capacitance of the circuit is. All right, so how much input capacitance do we see here? So let's take a moment and just uh, eyeball the circuit and see if we, we can find something based on our knowledge. Okay, without jumping into the equations and so forth. All right, okay, so the capacitance that we see at the input, meaning from the input to ground, includes this one. So that's straightforward, just like we have CGS here, we have CGD to ground. All right, but then we have this guy here. This is not from the input to ground, it's from input to the output. So what can I do with this? Maybe we can apply Miller's theorem to this capacitance, right? And see what we get. All right, so Miller says that let's take this capacitance and multiply it by the voltage gain from, uh, by one minus the voltage gain from here to here. Okay. How much is the voltage gain from here to here at low frequencies? Well, uh, we could say uh, this is an ideal current source, this is an ideal transistor, the voltage gain is 1. But if you want to be more realistic, let's assume there is some resistance here, right? There's some resistance here, which we can call RL. This resistance can model the output resistance of this current source. This is not an ideal current source, it has some output resistance, right? You can put it there. There's also the output resistance of this guy, which goes from here to AC ground, so that can be absorbed in RL. So we just make the circuit a little more realistic and say uh, there is some resistance from the output node to ground and we call that RL. Okay, so I want you to go back to electronics one and remember that the voltage gain of this source follower is what? You remember AV for the source follower was RS, this resistance, divided by Rs plus 1 over Gm, right? So you can also write that as Gmrs divided by 1 plus Gmrs. 
So remember that from electronics. One. Okay. So here I call it RL. There I call it RS. Same thing, right? Uh, so the voltage gain from here to here is given by this resistance divided by this distance plus 1 over GM. Or alternatively, I can say GM RL divided by 1 plus GM RL. All right, so let's try to decompose CGS. And I'm going to redraw the circuit. So here's what we have. We have CGD to ground. That's easy. Then this is decomposed according to Miller's theorem. And we will put one component of it here, which is equal to CGS times 1 minus AV. So that's equal to CGS 1 minus. The gain is positive, right? The gain is positive. So GM RS over 1 plus GM RS. And that's equal to, uh, we get cancellation here. So we have CGS over 1 plus GM RS. Right? So we have all of these. We have that capacitance, CSB. And then, of course, we also have the Miller effect of this capacitance at the output node, right? So that would be something here, which would be CGS times 1 minus 1 over AV, if you remember from Miller's theorem. All right, we are really interested in the input capacitance, so we don't worry about all the stuff out here. Let's just focus on what we have. So what we see is that the input capacitance of the circuit consists of two components, CGD, as expected, because that just goes from uh, the gate to AC ground, plus CGS, but not all of CGS, only a small fraction of CGS. So CGS divided by 1 plus GMRS. Sorry, I should call it GMRL to be consistent with this circuit. GMRL, so GMRL. This is RL. So if GMRL, GM of this device times the upper resistances that we have here is maybe 510, we see that uh, we don't see all of CGS at the input. So the input capacitance is actually quite lower than the CGS of the transistor. So that's a very interesting property of the source follower, right? Uh, that's not the case here. Here we saw the entire CGS because that just goes from the gate to AC ground. But here we don't see the entire CGS because we have signal on this side, we have signal on this side. The gain is positive but less than 1. So we end up with this reduction of the input capacitance. So interestingly, we have Miller effect, but the capacitance is not multiplied. The capacitance is actually reduced because of the way that things worked out. OK, so uh, just to hammer this in, just so that we really understand this, uh, I would like to go through an example. So, we want to intuitively explain why the input capacitance of the source follower is less than CGS. Okay? Why is it that this component is quite less than CGS? So we really want to understand that intuitively. Yes, the equations told us so, and that's okay, but what's the intuition behind it? All right? So that's the example that I want to go through. Uh, so uh, to do that, I'm going to go through it step by step starting from circuit theory 101. All right, so let's change the color. 
So, let's start with this experiment. I have a capacitor to ground, we call it C1. And I apply a voltage change of delta V here. How much charge do I deliver to this capacitor? If I want to change it by delta V. Q equals CV, right? So the charge that goes into here is equal to C1 times delta V. So far so good, right? So if the voltage on a capacitor changes by delta V, what we've done is we have given it a charge equal to C, C1 times delta V. All right, okay. Now let's make the situation a little more interesting. I have a, an amplifier with a voltage gain of exactly plus one. So AV is equal to plus one. And I have a capacitor from the input to the output, call it C1. And now I give it a step of delta V at this input. Okay, the question is, how much charge do we need to deliver to C1? So that's our quiz. The quiz is, how much charge do we deliver to C1? I will give you one minute to think about it. Okay, so what did you get for the amount of charge that we have to deliver to this capacitor? Well, if the input voltage changes by delta V, the output voltage also changes by delta V because the gain is plus one. So this output also goes up by delta V. So now let's look at the capacitor. The left plate of the capacitor went up by delta V. The right plate of the capacitor went up by delta V. The voltage across the capacitor did not change. So we didn't deliver any charge to the capacitor. So Q is zero. Right? So if I ask you, what is the input capacitance of this circuit? You would say zero. Because I can change the voltage however much I want, and I don't have to deliver charge to anybody, right? So if I have a voltage source here, and it changes this voltage, it doesn't need to deliver a charge to anything, so the input capacitance of the circuit is zero. So this topology has an interesting name. We, call, we say that this amplifier has bootstrapped this capacitor, meaning that the, this right plate of the capacitor moves up and down exactly as the left plate moves up and down. So the two sides of the capacitor go up and down together, so the capacitor voltage doesn't change, even though the input voltage and the output voltage change. So we say C1 is boot-strapped. Okay, C1 is bootstrapped by this amplifier. So that's a very different story from what we had here, right? In this case, the capacitor is grounded, so the input capacitance is C1. If I want to change the voltage, I have delivered charge. But here, C1 is connected from the input to the output of a, an amplifier with a gain of 1. So, when I change this voltage by some amount, I don't need to deliver any charge. 
Okay, so let's, let's make things a little more interesting and consider this case. So, an amplifier, a capacitor, C1, and let's say the gain of this amplifier is 0.9, plus 0.9. Now what happens? All right. Okay, so I change this input by delta V. The output changes by 0.9 times delta V. So what's the change in the voltage of the capacitor? The left plate goes up by delta V. The right plate goes up by 0.9 delta V. The voltage change on the capacitor is 0.1 delta V. So voltage change of, on cap is 0.1 delta V. That means that the charge that we deliver to that cap, the charge has to come this way, right? The charge that we deliver to the cap is given by C1 times 0.1 delta V. That means that the input capacitance is only 0.1 C1. So I can write this as 0.1 C1 delta V. And I say, see, I gave a change of delta V, and I delivered only this much charge, right? So the equivalent capacitance is 0.1. So input capacitance is 0.1 C1. All right. So this bootstrapping effect is very important and very interesting. And that's exactly what happens in the case of the source follower. So if this voltage goes up by some delta V, this voltage goes up. Not quite by delta V because this gain is less than 1, right? So maybe by 0.8 delta V or 0.9 delta V. That means that this CGS does not experience a large voltage change. One side goes up by delta V, one side goes up by 0.9 delta V. The net change is only 0.1 delta V. So yes, the effective CGS that we see is uh, CGS over 1 plus the gain. So that's why we look at uh, the input capacitance of the source follower. The emitter follower is similar. And that leads us to the concept of bootstrapping, which is very useful. And also the fact that the input capacitance is reduced because of this bootstrapping. Very well. Let's uh, carry on to the output impedance of the circuit and see what we get. So <coughs> output impedance of uh, followers so again uh, we consider a general case we have a resistance here and then we have a mass or bipolar stage of followers right something like this and to find the output impedance looking this way z out what we do is we're trying to find the Thevenant resistance. So the procedure is kill all independent sources. So this independent source is set to zero. Apply a voltage here, which we call Vx, small signal, and measure the resulting current. And Vx over Ix will be the small signal output impedance of the circuit. In Electronics 1, we found this without capacitances and it was approximately equal to 1 over GM. Now we want to include capacitances. And in fact, I'm going to include only one capacitance, CGS, and see what happens. All right? So again, I'm making some approximations. Yes, there is CGD from here to here. Uh, there is CSB from here to ground and all of that. But let's just focus on one capacitance because this gives us some interesting and beautiful results. In fact, we will see that the result that comes out of this, in some cases, encourages us to place a resistor here. Okay? Usually we say we don't like this resistor, right? But in some cases, actually, we will do that. Okay, so we have to find this output impedance. Uh, it doesn't look particularly obvious, so we will draw the small signal model. So here it is. Uh, we have... Uh, call this RS, uh, RG, 
RG, so RG is here. Then we have CGS. The voltage from the gate to the source is called V1. We have a dependent current source, GMV1. And uh, we have VX and IX applied here. And that's what we would like to find. This is AC ground. Okay. All right. This current source is assumed to be ideal, so it's open, it's gone. And that's all we have. Again, I'm just neglecting CGD and CD, CSB. All right, so how do we solve the circuit? Well, we just have to write our usual KVLs and KCLs and so forth. Our objective is to find Vx over Ix. Uh, but we have this, this uh, component we don't want, V1. So we have to write some equations, eliminate V1, and then find Vx over Ix. All right, so um, what can I write? Well, uh, uh, let's suppose that we write, for example, a KCL at the output node. So KCL. Uh, how much is this current? The current flowing through CGS downward. Well, it's the voltage over the impedance. So that would be V1 CGS S. And then this current is flowing downward. It's called GMV1. And these two currents plus Ix should be zero, right? They're all flowing to the node. So plus Ix should be zero. So that readily tells me that V1 is equal to minus Ix divided by CGS plus GM1, right? CGS plus GM. CGS S plus GM. Okay, so we found V1. We just need to write one more equation that has Vx and Ix and maybe V1, and then that will solve the circuit. What other equations can we write? We wrote the KV KCL here. Maybe one more KVL. Uh, where should I write the KVL? Well, I'm going to go around this loop here. Starting from zero, have some voltage on this resistor, some voltage on this capacitor, and then Vx. So those all have to add up to zero. Okay, so we can write Vx uh, plus V1. This voltage plus this voltage is this voltage, right? So this voltage plus this voltage is the voltage from here to ground. Can I find the voltage across RG? Well, if I have the current through RG and I multiply by RG, is the voltage. So how much is the current flowing through RG? This current. If I find this current and multiply by RG, it will be this voltage, and that voltage will be Vx plus V1, right? Okay. So... The current flowing through RG is actually the same as the current flowing through CGS. The current flowing through CGS is V1 divided by this impedance, but that would be going this way. I'm interested in this way, so I just have to multiply it by minus 1. So, the current through RG is minus V1 CGS S, right? This current is V1 CGS S. This current is minus V1 CGSS. This flows through RG and generates a voltage. So I multiply by RG. And this voltage is the same as the sum of these two. So that's what we got, right? So now I can plug in for V1 from here, and I can simplify, and uh, that gives me the equation for the output impedance of the circuit. So let me write that here. Uh, because I have more room, Ivx over Ix, and uh, that will come out to be something like this. It will be CGSS plus GM, like so. And uh, let's see if I have the expression here. And then we have 1 plus GM RGS. 
So that is the equation that we obtain for the output impedance of the source follower, assuming that uh, CGD is neglected and CSB is neglected. And of course, channel length modulation is neglected too. Okay? All right, so this equation actually carries a lot of insight behind it. Uh, of course, if S is zero, you see that it reduces to one over GM, which we rec expect, one over GM at low frequencies. But it has some other interesting and beautiful properties. And we'll leave those for the next lecture. So this concludes the lecture today. I will see you next time.